So today is the 15th Sunday after Pentecost. I'm going to be here again in in Vanita, Oregon. And the epistle for this 15th Sunday is taken from Paul's letter to Galatians chapter 5. Brethren, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be made so desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, if a man be overtaken by any fault, who, who, you who are spiritual, instruct such a one in the, in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so you shall fulfill the law of Christ. For if any man think himself to be something, whereas he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every one prove his own work, and so he shall have glory in himself only, and not in another. For every one shall bear his own burden. Let him that is instructed in the word communicate to him that instructeth him in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For what things a man shall sow, those also shall he reap. For he that soweth in his flesh of the flesh also shall reap corruption. But he that soweth in the spirit of the spirit also shall reap life everlasting. And in doing good let us not fail. For in due time we shall reap not failing. Therefore whilst we have time, let us work good to all men, but especially those who are to those who are of the household of the faith. And then the gospel. Taking that according to St. Luke chapter 7. At that time Jesus went into a city that is called Naim. And there went with him his disciples and a great multitude. And when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a great multitude of the city was with her, whom when the Lord had seen, being moved with mercy towards her, he said to her, Weep not. And he came near and touched the bier. And they that carried it stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he gave him to his mother. And there came a fear on them all. And they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen him up among us, and God hath visited his people. That's for the words of today's Holy Gospel. Father and Son of the Ghost, Amen. Today, a few considerations on the three raisings of the dead recorded in sacred scripture in the gospel. The second one is in the gospel today, the raising of the widow of Naim. And St. Augustine speaks about it and he says, first of all, we know that as St. John says in his gospel, that our Lord did so many miracles that they could not be recorded in all the books of the world. So that we know that he rose thousands and thousands of people from the dead. Thousands. We have, in the, for instance, in the life of St. Francis Xavier, as one example, we know that he rose about 40 people from the dead. And our Lord Jesus Christ raised many, many more. Thousands he would have risen from the dead. At least hundreds and hundreds he rose from the dead. But three are recorded in the gospel. And St. John tells us these 26 miracles, these miracles are recorded in the gospel for your instruction. And therefore, St. <clears throat> Saint, Saint Augustine says, what's the instruction? Out of the thousands of miracles, many would have been so much greater than this. The apostles would have chosen another miracle, another rising from the dead, another one. But these three were chosen by the Holy Ghost. The first one was the raising of the daughter of Jairus. And St. Augustine points out the raising of the daughter of Jairus. <clears throat> daughter of Jairus was found dead in the house. The second was the raising of the widow of Naim, which is in the gospel today, the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, who is found dead and raised by Christ between the house and the cemetery, being carried on the way to the cemetery on the day of the burial. And the third is Lazarus, who is not only uh, dead, but uh, on the way to the cemetery, but already dead and buried for four days. So we have three levels of death, says St. Augustine. And God gave this instruction to teach us about death. Many other, many things he wanted to teach, but one consideration of Augustus today is about the death of sin. And we need to analyze sin. 
One of the mysteries of the world is we know in today there are 7 billion people in the world. And the vast, vast majority of them are enemies of God. And the vast majority of them hate God. The vast majority love their sins and want to die in their sins. And they shall die in their sins. And one can say on the, on the, on the mathematical side, 7 billion souls on the path to hell. 7 billion souls, almost all of them in the control of Satan. And so few of the saints. Here referring to the saints in the writing of St. Peter, which is those who are of the household of the faith, who have the true faith, who are living in the grace. Because remember that in the, when we die, we're either going to be saints in heaven or we're going to be damned in hell. And there are so few of those living the life of grace. So few of those who have the faith. So 0.0000001% of all the people on earth are having the faith. And has the world ever been in this situation before? What does our Lord Jesus Christ say? When he looks at the world. And remember when he looked at the world, it was the year 33 AD. And in that year, when he looked at the world, there were a total of less than, there were 12 followers. And one of them would be Judas. There were not yet 5,000 faithful followers. In fact, there were, almost, there were no faithful followers. 11 followers were clean, but they didn't understand. And so when Christ looked out upon the world, he said, Pray to the Lord of the harvest, because the harvest indeed is ripe. The harvest indeed is ready, but the laborers are few. And so we look at the harvest. What is the harvest? These are souls that are immersed in sin. Souls that are all of them, 100% of the people on earth, the exception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Outside of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Lord Jesus Christ, those two human beings, every other human being on earth is conceived with original sin. Every other human being on earth was born into the kingdom of hell. And how long has it been like that? Since Adam committed his sin. That's how long it's been like that. And how long has the harvest been ripe? For 2,000 years. So what is it? Sin is always sin. Death is always death. Murder is always murder. Heresy is always heresy. And St. Augustine also says in another sermon of his, and St. Gregory of Nyssa, I believe, said the same thing. He says, consider the householder. He went into the marriage feast to look at the guests. He went into the marriage feast to look at the guests. And the guests were many. And only one guest had not on the wedding garment. Does this mean only one out of several thousand, or say there's 300 at the feast? Does this mean one out of 300 are in sin and 299 are friends of God? St. Augustine says, no. The vast majority are that one. But of the millions and millions and millions of sinners of every type, they have no variety. They have no variety whatsoever. Every murderer is the same. Every heretic is the same. Every liar is the same. Every impure is the same. All of the sins are the same. And the more you immerse in sin, the more you lose your identity, the more you lose your individuality, and the more you become like a thing, the more you become dead, the more you become uh, like everything else. And hence, there are not very many types of sinners, but there are many types of just. Hence, the householder came in and saw 299 different kinds of souls pleasing to him. 350 types of souls pleasing to him, and only one that had not on the wedding garment, which represents the vast majority of men. So if we look at 2017, 7 billion, more than 7 billion people on the earth, and the majority of them are the enemies of God. The majority of them are living in sin, and getting deeper and deeper in sin. But consider the percentages in the year 33 AD, 2,000 years ago. The percentages were worse. When our Lord Jesus Christ said, pray to the Lord of the harvest, because the problem is there are not laborers. The problem is not the harvest. And this is actually one thing we've noticed in the preaching, and then one of the faults of the preaching of the last hundred years, in many, many cases. We see the difficulties of our families. We see it. We see the difficulties of each generation. Each generation in the last hundred years is weaker than the one that came before it. Each generation is more immersed in selfishness. Each generation is deeper in the sin than the one that came before it. 
As Father Ribbiger says in one of his talks of a few a year a year and a half ago, he says that the he believes that the the uh, characteristics, the devils of this particular generation, are the devil of paganism and depravity. So that what's normal in our times is paganism and depravity. That's normal. It used to be exceptional, but now it's normal. Sin has gotten more deep. One of the signs of paganism, tattoos, now spread everywhere. It's the pagans who invented tattoos. And now everyone has pagan has, t- has tattoos. They're all imitating the pagans. Now, let's consider these three miracles. There are three dead souls. The widow of Naim, the daughter of Jairus, the son of the widow of Naim, and Lazarus. Consider their age. The daughter of Jairus is 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. The son of the widow of Naim is perhaps in his 20s. Lazarus is 50, 60, 70 years old. So Lazarus is older, and the youngest is the daughter of, of Jairus. The one is found dead in the house. The next is found dead on the path of the cemetery. And the third is found dead after four days. Now let's consider their death. Which one is more dead? It turns out that the analysis of the munchkins, of the coroner, he said of the wicked witch of the west that she's not only merely dead, east, she's not only merely dead, but she's really most sincerely dead. So there's dead, there's really dead, there's really most, really, really most dead, and there's really most sincerely dead, and that means you are downright dead. But the fact is, why was it put into the story? Why was it made? Because it's a joke. Why is it a joke? Because dead is dead is dead. There's no difference between dead, really dead, really most dead, really most sincerely dead, and however further you want to go. Dead means dead. Dead means hell. Dead means separated from God. Dead means finished. No one can be raised from death without a miraculous intervention of heaven. Where does it come from? We visit the first case. The first cause of the raising of death. Of course, our Lord Jesus Christ is God, and He's always the cause. But what did He do the first time? The daughter of Jairus was dead inside the house. And the people were outside the house. It must have been a small house. And he took Peter, James, and John. And he did not take all the twelve apostles. He left nine apostles outside. He took Peter, James, and John. And he said, come with me inside the house. For he's not dead. She's not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. And he went inside the house. And with Peter, James, and John, raised her from the dead. Remember that he said, it was in the gospel just yesterday, actually, because we had a requiem mass for a priest, the deceased priest, Father Methodius, pray for him, and uh, that uh, he died, and also pray for uh, uh, Daniel uh, McDonald, who uh, was an 18-year-old boy, who used to, used to be with the resistance in New Jersey, and uh, moved now to St. Mary's, Kansas, but he was killed in a car accident yesterday afternoon. And uh, so the 18 years old, one of 13 children, and was just getting ready to go off to the ROTC to the Air Force and was killed in an accident just a few mile, a few mile, just a mile and a half outside of St. Mary's, Kansas yesterday. And his father, Dylan McDonald, was a classmate of mine in the seminary. We entered the seminary together. And uh, so do pray for Mr. Daniel. He was able to be anointed immediately after his death by one of the priests in St. Mary's who immediately came over to the place of the, of the accident and anointed him. But do keep him in the family in your prayers. We had uh, two deaths in the last day and a half. Father Methodius in India, an 85-year-old priest, plus or minus, and then Daniel uh, McDonald just yesterday. And uh, so do please uh, keep him in your prayers. He uh, was formerly in the resistance, now in, in St. Mary's, uh, Kansas. And so please keep him in, in your prayers. And then also, but in any case, we have this mystery of death. And this mystery of death that the three Peter, James, and John, Peter, James, and John, entered into the house with our Lord Jesus Christ. What's the first way to raise sin? Now, St. Augustine says the first sin that we're considered here are the sins of the mind, the interior sins. These are the sins that kill the soul. 
Now, what happens when you die with an interior sin? Your soul dies and, and you begin to decay. So your soul dies on the inside, the daughter of Jairus. Always a daughter. Why a daughter? Because the church has always referred to the soul as in the feminine. Anima is a feminine term. The soul is feminine. We refer to the soul as she. We refer to the soul as feminine. And so the soul dies. She dies. Later it expresses itself in the external forum. And the external forum is a place of man. The internal, the house, the place of woman. Hence the soul as we say she. We get to the outside forum and we say he. And there we see a boy on his way. He's now exposing his sins in the second level, the son of the widow of Naim. But in the first level, the three, Peter, James, and John, they come into the house. St. Peter is the Pope, the head of the church. St. John is the beloved apostle. And James is the first martyr. So we have the first head of the church, the first teacher of truth. We have the first martyr, and we have the first beloved these souls have the power to enter inside of souls. Remember when the Romans hated God and they put to death the Catholics. What happened? As they shed the blood of the followers of our Lord Jesus Christ, the members of his mystical body of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, the blood converted those in the crowd. The blood converted the, 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 uh, the, the, the soldiers. The blood converted the bystanders. And in some cases converted the actual murderer, the actual judge himself. The blood converts. So when we see wickedness spreading throughout the world, what's the problem? There's a lack of priests who are shedding their blood. There's a lack of apostles shedding their blood. These three things have to happen. The shedding of blood. The shedding of blood, says uh, the, say the saints, equals the pouring of oneself out. We have to pour ourselves out, spend ourselves for the good of souls. This is not being done. And it's not been done in the church by the majority of priests, and the majority of religious, and the majority of followers of Christ for several hundred years. The number of those that spread their blood has diminished and diminished. And hence the number of those that die has increased and increased. And the faith of St. Peter brought inside. We must understand that doctrine saves souls. We don't think that anymore. Doctrine saves souls. The word doctor means teacher. And when you go to the doctor, he tells you you're a diabetic. Don't eat pure sugar anymore you're educated don't eat pure sugar anymore eat these things called vegetables and so the doctor tells you you have to eat something called vegetables the stuff that cows eat and you have to stop eating pure sugar high fructose corn syrup you have to stop eating that and stop drinking that you're educated and so you know that you don't eat those things and even today in our modern world education is essential to doctoring. You can never have doctoring without education. We human beings have a mind. No one can go to heaven without education. That means the doctor, the priest's first way that he doctors a soul is by teaching you the truth. If you continue to live with that girl that's not your wife, you are going to burn. You are going to go to hell. If you continue to live in that life of sin, you are going to go to hell. Do you understand that? Now after they understand it, they can then get the grace to separate from the third wife. They can get the grace to separate from the woman they're living in sin with. And they can get the grace to step away from their heretical and evil life. So St. Peter represents true doctrine. He goes into the house and the doctrine's got to be poured into the mind. The doctrine's got to be poured into the heart. So this doctrine is not the doctrine that's only preached in the pulpit. It's not the doctrine that's only written in encyclicals. This doctrine is always available. Unfortunately, in our times, it's no longer easily available because the encyclicals of the modern popes are heretical. The modern pulpits are filled with heresy and error and leading souls astray. And hence, grave problems. Peter is no longer entering into the house to save souls. James is no longer entering the house to save souls because he's not ready to sacrifice you know why they tell you to come up and be anointed? And now when you're about 75, 80 years old, come to the front of the church and get anointed. They don't even do that anymore, but they did the 70s and 80s because they still had some kind of a conscience, the priests. So they bring them come up, anoint, so that when you're dying at 3 o'clock in the morning, I don't, have to, I don't have to disturb my beauty sleep in order to get up and go and anoint you. 
And so the priest doesn't want to be bothered at 3 o'clock in the morning to go anoint someone. And so therefore they say, just come up to the communion rail. And it's time for confessions. Well, that's on Saturday. That's on Sunday. Don't bother me at any other time for confessions. You need help? Don't bother me at any other time. One reason why priests run around incognito and they don't wear their cassocks and don't wear their clerical garb is so that they won't be bothered. And hence, the priests no longer enter the souls. They're no longer teaching. No longer Peter entering the soul. No longer James entering the soul. And John. What is St. John? John is in front of the Blessed Sacrament. John prays in the church. And here is what the church, we always consider the great sacred consecration of a church. What is a church? It's a place that houses the altar. It's a place where the sacrifice of Mass takes place. It's a place where Christ dies on the altar. It's a place of the crucifix. The place of Christ himself. You come to the church to adore Christ. But what do we say on the day that the bishop consecrates a church? He consecrates a church. He puts the ashes on the floor. He makes the alpha to the omega. He makes the A to the Z. And the storm of a cross. He anoints the sides of the altar. He cuts the sides of the walls. He anoints the altar. Puts the altar on fire. And then we sing, Locus iste sanctus est. In quo ora sacerdos. This is a holy place in which the priest prays. Why all the anointing? Why the altar? Why the burning of the altar? Why the union of the walls? Why the five hour ceremony of sprinkling and incense? So that a priest can pray here. That is a priest of this world. A priest now. A priest of this time. A living priest. Not for St. John the Baptist or St. John Vianney or St. Pius X who are now in heaven. But for the living priest of 2017. He has to go into the church. He has to be in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament and he has to pray. This is why it's called the holy place. Now the priest that prays enters into the soul. The priest that pours himself out enters into the soul. The priest that preaches the divine truth without all alteration enters into the soul. And without these three, what do we have? Nothing. Nothing. And so what's the problem? The minimum prayer. The minimum pouring oneself out. We're not talking about heroic things here. And the minimum teaching of the truth. This is enough to get inside of the interior of the souls. Peter, James, and John enter. The other nine apostles do not. Hence, the Christ makes it clear. Not every priest enters the soul. Not every priest enters into the battlefield. Many priests are ordained. They're made holy priests on the day of their consecration, the day they're ordained a priest. They live 65, 70 years of priesthood. They say Mass every day. They teach. They don't even teach heresies. And they have never been a priest for one moment of their life. Though they're valid priests. They've never injured a soul. As Cardinal, not, uh, Cardinal uh, Spellman said in, uh, in, in uh, I believe in Boston, he said on his 50th anniversary of priesthood, I can say with great pride, or right, they're not Cardinal Spellman, Cardinal Cushing, I can say with great pride that in the 50 years of my priesthood, I have not converted one soul to the Catholic faith. That's what he said on his 50th anniversary of priesthood. Was he a priest? Valid? Yes. He was ordained before Vatican II in the 1920s. Was he a valid priest? Yes. Ordained in the 1920s, consecrated in the 1930s. And worked his entire priesthood without entering the souls. And how many bishops like that? How many priests like that? What happens? The souls turn more and more away from God. Who is to blame? The Catholic priest. It's a problem of the Father. Who is also to blame in a secondary way? The Catholics who are living the faith. They were not doing the minimum of Peter, James, and John entering the soul. Peter, know your catechism. James, sacrifice for the good of the church and for the good of the poor. Do something. And John, pray. In the fall in the home, that means say a rosary each day. Pray in the family of the family. Now we go to the second stage of death. The second stage of death is more serious. In this stage of death, we see that the soul is out in sin. And that's the son of the widow of Naim. St. Augustine says about him, he says, the son of the widow of Naim, he thinks he's alive. 
Because he hears music. He doesn't realize it's the sound of the criers and the sound of the pallbearers and the sound of the music of death as they're going on the way to the graveyard. He thinks he's alive because he's moving. Because he read in his little biological manual and his philosophical manual of St. Thomas, life equals self-movement. He's moving. He was at the house, now he's traveling. He doesn't realize he's traveling dead on a bier. And there are four men carrying him. These are bad companions, says St. Augustine. And bad companions are not just people you go to the bar with. They're not just people that you sing with. These are the obvious bad companions. But bad companions are those that you hang out with that lead you away from the faith. For instance, bad companions for traditional Catholics <coughs> right now are the nice Protestants <coughs> that you are friends with. And the good people of the fraternity of St. Peter and the end old mass, they're such nice people. And they're so understanding. And you spend time with them. And you know what? What matters is being moral. What matters is being good. You don't have to believe all those backwards teachings about the Catholic Church, the only true church outside of which there's no salvation. And there's only one truth. And we have to go with the one truth. We don't need that. We've got to be more balanced in our dress, more balanced in the number of kids we have, more balanced in our life. And you walk away from God and you think you're alive. But are you doing this because you think it's right? No. Are you doing it because you're inspired by the Holy Ghost? No. You're doing it because you're being carried. Carried by the world. Carried by the stream. And the stream only goes down. The stream never flows up. It only flows down. And hence the problem of the second one. The bad companions. And he believes he's alive, but he's dead. And he doesn't realize, says St. Augustine, he will arrive one day at the grave and he'll be surrounded by all kinds of noise and they shall all be weeping and it'll be like the Italian mother in New York when she was at the burial of her husband and they were standing at the tomb and they're holding the, 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 the coffin and she was weeping <laughs> checking her watch <laughs> okay let's eat she cried for three minutes and then it was time for eating. They threw the body in the grave. Everybody went out to dinner. That at some point, the tears shall end suddenly. The music shall stop suddenly. Dirt shall fill your hole suddenly. And you shall be completely alone, says St. Augustine. Remember that those who have bad companions, none of them will share your damnation. <clears throat> None of them are going to say, boy, I, I wish I could suffer with you in hell. Absolutely not. They will abandon you completely and suddenly. This case is very serious. Now, these are also the open sinners. The open sinners, we can see their sins on the outside. Because you see, the son of the widow of Naim, he's in public. Everybody can see he's dead. These are the public sinners, like Madonna. These are the public centers like Obama and Hillary. These are the public centers that everyone in the world can see. These people are evil. And what do we do? We give up on them. We no longer pray for them. We curse them. And not only do we give up on them, Christ also gives up on them. And what happens in the widow of Naim in the gospel today? Our Lord Jesus Christ is walking by, and there goes the son of the widow of Naim, and he is dead. He is not moved in his heart. His most sacred heart is not moved. But then he notices something, and the gospel tells us what he notices. Behold, the dead man was carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a great multitude of the city was with her, whom when the Lord had seen, be moved with mercy towards her, not towards him. He said to her, weep not. Our Lord Jesus Christ was not touched by the child. He was angry with him and ready to receive him in eternal judgment. But the church wept. Where did the church weep for the wicked sinners? That weeping takes place in monasteries. That weeping takes place in souls who are victim souls that offer up the suffering of their life for the salvation of souls. These souls are all over the church. Where are they now? They're gone. And so we have the first problem. 
Peter, James, and John are no longer walking into souls. And so more and more are dead of the seven billion on the world today. And the victim souls, and the, the sisters, and the brothers, and the monks, and the priests also, and the faithful that have suffering, those in nursing homes, those in hospitals, those abandoned by their families, who are not taking their suffering and offering it for the good of the church, these souls are the cause of depravity being more and more open all around us. Remember when St. Teresa of the child Jesus saw that most wicked man who refused to repent, the murderer in France. She prayed for him, she wept for him, and even though he refused confession just before he died, he kissed the crucifix and he was repented of his sin and he was saved his soul. Why did he save his soul? Because our Lord Jesus Christ saw the tears of Teresa. He wasn't, he would condemned already that man. So where are the Teresas of the child Jesus? Where are the souls that are offering up themselves for sinners? Then we arrive at the third level. The third level is that of Lazarus. St. Augustine reminds us, remember that Lazarus was a good man. So he was a good man. And this is the truth. But in the representation of the parable, or not a parable, it's a historical fact, but the representation for the spiritual life, he represents a soul buried and immersed in sin. And Martha makes it clear when she says, Lord, he stinketh. He is completely rotted in the sin. This is the state of our world today. It's the general state of 2017. Everyone in the world, not everyone, but the vast majority of souls are rotted in sin. They're not just in sin. For instance, when you walk by a cemetery, you are not disgusted. You're not shocked. When you walk into the street and you see a dead body, freshly dead, you're in a state of shock. You go to a cemetery, there's thousands of dead bodies. There's no shock because they're dead for a long time. The shock will be if one of the stones, stones moves and one of the tombs opens up and one of the bodies comes out. Then you're shocked. But that they're dead, there's no shock. So it is with the world today. We find people living together in sin. Open homosexuality. Leaving the Catholic Church. Fishing on Sunday. Watching football on Sunday. And being very open about the fact that they're not worshiping God on Sunday. And no one has a problem with it. They're dead. And they like being dead. And nobody's sad about it. You have the wife and the husband... The man and his girlfriend, the second wife and the third husband, all coming together, all together, everybody gets along, because they're all dead. Even the one that's in the first marriage is dead, because very often it's an invalid first marriage. So that they're not only going to be invalid in their second marriage, third marriage, and fourth marriage, they're going to make sure the first marriage is invalid too, because they refuse children, and they're all living in sin. And they all are immersed in wickedness. And they all abort their children. And they all have one or two children, maybe. And they all are accepting all religions. And they all want comfort. And they are immersed in sin. And no one is shocked. No one is surprised. This is the state of Lazarus. So everyone comes to the graveyard. St. Augustine says, everyone comes to the graveyard. Why do they come? Because of Mary Magdalene. Because she's weeping. And to comfort her. But no one has hope for him. Now what happens here? Our Lord Jesus Christ sees Mary Magdalene. Our Lord Jesus Christ speaks to St. Martha. Our Lord Jesus Christ looks at the tomb and he weeps. There must be a weeping. There should be the weeping of the priest. The interior weeping of the priest. There has to be the weeping of the soul that is most close to Christ. And this weeping takes place. And when he weeps, then he stands up and says, roll back the stone. We're going to pull Lazarus forth out. Unwrap his clothing. He's wrapped. He's completely wrapped in sin. He's completely tied up in sin. Roll back the stone. Pull him out. We're going to take the soul from the very depth of sin and going to bring him forth. And when he is brought forth, there will be souls that will convert. And this is one of the things that shall happen in the near future. There will be most wicked souls immersed in wickedness that the Blessed Virgin Mary is going to touch with grace and they're going to convert in the chastisement. Like Saul of Tarsus, he was one such soul immersed in sin, 
filled with wickedness, with a desire to stay in his wickedness. But the grace of God touched him. And Ananias was afraid. You want me to go to Saul? He's the most wicked man. I have heard of the wickedness of Saul. You go to Saul and you cure his blindness. And so Ananias obeyed. And so Ananias obeyed. Stephen prayed and died. And they shed their blood. And Saul converted and became a great saint. The greatest of the apostles. The same thing will happen in our times. It's happened before. It'll happen again. Now what is the crisis in all three of these deaths? Our Lord Jesus Christ says... The harvest indeed is great. What's the problem? The laborers. And what's the problem of the laborers? They don't have faith. Remember that when we go to battle, we carry Christ. And if you go to battle and there's a hundred men in front of you, you get to kill a hundred men today. If you go to battle and there's a thousand, okay, we kill a thousand today. If there's a million, all right, let's get started. We got to get a million done before sunset. But the fact is, that when we go to battle with Christ, we go with victory, we go unable to be defeated, we go with complete confidence, we go with faith. What's the problem? The lack of a living supernatural faith. This faith must be filled with hope, which is complete confidence, and expresses itself in a perfect charity to go out and save all souls. This is what must be. Even in our most terrible time of 2017, where the whole world has turned more and more against God, and we have a wicked pope and wicked bishops and wicked priests and wicked souls all around us, is that the problem? If that was the problem, it would mean Christ is not strong enough to defeat his enemies. If that was the problem, it would mean our Lord Jesus Christ is not totally in control. But he is totally in control, and they're not a problem. Remember when our Lord said those words, the harvest is great, it was shortly before the crucifixion. Shortly before his 12 apostles, all 12 of them, not just Judas, abandoned him. Shortly before everyone forgot him and didn't believe in him except his only mother. And it was shortly before that that he said, the harvest is great, the laborers are few. Where is the heart of Richard, Richard the lion heart, who forgot in the battle of Jaffa, that he only had three horses that could run and forgot that his army could not keep up with him. He saw only the enemy and he charged alone and he defeated them. Same thing Alexander the Great did when he forgot that his soldiers couldn't make it over the wall in India. He charged first over the wall on the bamboo ladders, not knowing the weakness of bamboo with his armor. And only three or four of the soldiers made it over the wall. The bamboo ladders broke. And with four soldiers and, and, and Alexander the Great, he wasn't just a great general. He said, all right, we'll have to conquer the city by ourselves. Let's get over there to the gate and open it. He fought his way to the gate, opened the gate, led his other soldiers in and defeated that city in northern India. And so the fact is, great souls don't just make great plans. They fight with a great heart. And they cannot be stopped. And so it must be that in our fight against the enemies of God, we must recognize the problem is not that there are too few of us. The problem is not that there are too many of them. And this is made clear in the death of these three souls. Peter, James, and John came in and the daughter of Jairus was raised. The widow, which is our Holy Mother Church and the suffering souls in the church that offer themselves to the good of souls, prayed and wept and then the son of Naim was raised from the dead in the gospel today and Christ wept and Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and Martha came to the tomb they had to go to the tomb we have to go visit you know that one person told me very recently I wouldn't visit but if Pope Francis was across the street I wouldn't walk across the street to go visit him I might walk across the street to do something else but not to go visit him but the fact is, we must visit. We must visit Pope Francis in our hearts. We pray for him in every Mass. Yes, he is the most wicked Pope working against God. But we must pray for his conversion. We have to visit the tomb, knowing that he's dead. We have to visit the tomb of the lost souls, knowing that they are dead. Until the moment that they physically go to death, they can be risen from the dead. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The day is now at hand when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of Man. And whoever hears, he shall have life. 
And he says the dead shall hear. That was in the gospel yesterday of the first mass of November the 2nd. That this is, this is the dead shall hear the voice of God. Now there are dead everywhere. The voice must be spoken. The voice must be spoken with confidence. And we must ask the grace from the holy prayers of those souls suffering. There are many suffering souls in our time today. Not just those that are in hospital beds. But young girls who are now only 63 years old looking for a husband. Looking for a husband because they can't find a good husband. Young men looking for a wife that's pretty much hopeless and because they can't find a good Catholic wife. And then souls just leave, seem to be alone in their rooms, alone, abandoned. Their wife left them. Their husband left them. They feel abandoned. They're in the sorrow of only a few people in the area practicing the faith. And yet they're fighting their own sins and struggling and trying to be pleasing to God. Those sufferings, those pains, those agonies of the heart, they can be offered up for the salvation of souls. They can be offered up for the conversion of priests and for priests to persevere in their priesthood. They can be offered up for the good of the church. And even if they're very weak sufferings, offered in a very small way, they shall reach to the ends of heaven and save souls. God is determined that the salvation of souls does not depend primarily on the saints. It doesn't depend primarily on the angels. They assist. They assist. But it doesn't depend primarily on them. It depends on souls living right now in 2017 that are going to offer their hearts and their lives for the salvation of souls, for the spreading of the faith, shed their blood. Doesn't necessarily mean the physical shedding of blood. That gift will come to the blessed. But it's not necessarily the physical shedding of blood, but the shedding of blood by pouring ourselves out that others may be benefited, that others may be brought to Christ. And then the harvest is great. It is not a problem that there's an insufficient harvest. There's too many bad guys, not enough good guys. That there wasn't enough rain this year. That there was a drought. That's not the problem. The problem is in us. One soul with faith can transform the world. As Saint John, as the devil said concerning St. John Vianney, if there were three more like him, my kingdom on earth would be destroyed. He knows the power of faith. Not the foolish faith of the Protestants, a fake belief, which isn't belief, but the real belief, which is with hope and charity, the real belief with confidence. That is what wins the day. And let's have confidence in that and have that faith, and God will give us the victory. In any case, we, we can overcome the difficulty of sin by those three deaths, the death inside the heart of the daughter of Jairus, the death of the souls visibly dead like the public sinners, like the widow, the son of the widow Naim, and the death of those so immersed in sin that we think nothing of it, the death of the sins of our age. Close God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.